Good morning, students. We're still in our, our cool weather mode. I hope everybody's doing okay. I'll have uh, announcements uh, or announcement about our next test just to kind of clue you in on all of that. Uh, um, I'm doing the testing, like I said before, just so that we can have uh, an assessment uh, before the uh, Thanksgiving break. I know those of you in the early college high school have the whole week off, but uh, this way we can get some work done and, and an assessment out of the way to kind of clear up uh, the way for the end of the term. So I don't, like I said before, I don't want things to be too crowded. And this gives us an opportunity to test with maybe a little less material. So I'll have some information up about that. And um, again, once, once you've completed the work, uh, for your Calculus two class, then, then maybe you can take a couple of days to, to relax a little or maybe study and do, what, do whatever you like. Um, I think it's good to have a break, but don't, don't take too much of a break and get out of the routine. So what I wanted to do today um, is again, move into the parametric equations, but there were a couple of examples that I just want to do uh, from the previous, uh, topics uh, that I didn't have time to cover uh, on the last class, just, uh, just to cover some ideas that will hopefully reinforce what we've been doing. So let me share my screen. So for this part, we remember we did our, our big treatise on the uh, binomial theorem, and it is, a, it is a landmark result. And of course, uh, we spent a little bit of time trying to figure out how uh, we could actually show that the given infinite series converges uh, to the one plus X raised to the K. And that was not a simple process at all. And we could not use uh, the remainder term uh, going to zero. Uh, that really was not something that was easy to do. Uh, and so we found another way looking at differential equations uh, variable coefficients and manipulating the series. And I think that's a really nice way to do it because it, it gives you more practice with manipulating indices. And also when you get to your differential equations class, uh, you will use series to solve uh, linear differential equations with variable coefficients. So, so there's always a reason why we do what we do. But just to get a little extra practice, I wanna do a couple of web assigned problems uh, that utilize uh, some of the techniques from that last section. So as remember, as you do your problems, you can work whatever method you like. You can use your list of power series to assist you. You can use the geometric series. You have many techniques available to you. I don't insist that you do your problems a particular way, but I do insist that you use good mathematics. And so just keep that in mind as you do your work. Now. Here's an example. I thought about this after we finished our last lecture. I said the students could stand to see another one of these. So let's use the binomial theorem. Use the binomial theorem to compute a Maclaurin series. four. Now, the last one we did, we did the square root, and that took a lot of computation, but this one won't be so bad. They don't all have to take forever, and I don't think in this case, I'm looking through it, I don't have to use, we won't have to use that special uh, combinatorial formula for this one. I think we'll be okay, um, and this particular function is one divided by one plus x to the fifth. So when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, this is binomial. And the neat thing about it is that we can utilize the techniques uh, from our previous lecture. And so we're gonna see that the K is negative five. And so we're not gonna have any hope for getting convergence at the endpoints uh, via that convergence theorem result that I gave last class, but that's okay, we can live with it. So we have one plus X 
to the negative five. So in this case, K equals negative five. And that's the key. Now, as you look in the notes, a lot of times I'll just do the calculation in the infinite series, but I'm always thinking about ways that keep the work a little bit simpler. Let me adjust my uh, document cam a little bit. So use the space a little bit better. There we go. And so I was thinking, well, if we do it, if we do it this way, where we just kind of separate out the coefficient, the binomial coefficient, figure out what that is, and then put it back into the series will be fine. So just let's just recall how we set this up. We we proved this last time that one plus k or one plus x to the k power where k can be any real number is equivalent to this infinite series, this power series, n equals zero to infinity. I always have to move this cursor over. Good old technology. And we'll have k choose n, x to the n. So we, we like this series because at least we know what it is. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And so we can now analyze the binomial coefficient. So first, let's just go ahead and look at that and reduce it like we did before. And in this particular case, we can think of, uh, for instance, starting with n equal one and moving up and then adjusting the series as we need to. WebAssign will always give you a hint with that. So remember, in this particular case, we start with negative five and we decrease by one. We do the falling factorial. So this will be negative five. And then we have a negative five minus a one. So these are a lot easier numbers. And then a negative five minus a two. Then we have negative five minus n plus one. So that's the, the, the deal where we have the k minus n plus one from our general formula divided by n factorial. Now, when you look at this and you think about what we need to do, notice we have n of these factors, we have n factors here, and in each of them we have a negative. So let's go ahead and, and think about what this is going to be if we just factor the negative and then reduce the coefficients. First thing we're going to notice, and I'll do this in red, when we combine the terms here, we just get, an, in this case, a negative n minus a 4. And so when we look at that, we're thinking, okay, let's just go ahead and factor the n negative ones. So like I said before, I'm thinking doing this separately will make the problem a little bit easier. So we have n of these factors by definition, and we have a negative in each one that we can easily factor. And so what does this leave us with? Well, that gives us a five, and then a six and a seven etc. And then we uh, terminate with n plus 4 when we factor the negative. So if you think about the last problem that we did, this one is a whole lot simpler. When we had the one halves, we had to take care of the fractions and then adjust things. So that was a little bit more work. That's why I did that problem first, just to get your feet wet so that maybe pushing you off into the deep end a little bit more would, would make more of an impression. And so now when you look at this, it's not nearly as, as, as challenging. Now, we, we always look for some patterns here. And what we can see that, that's kind of interesting here is that this is basically the n plus four factorial, but we lack the one, the two, the three, and the four that would proceed here. 
So if we wanted to make our uh, coefficient a little bit more user friendly, even though WebAssign wouldn't care, I mean, as long as it's equivalent uh, to a correct response, you get a you get a green check. But just noticing the pattern here, we can make a little uh, adjustment. So we'll get negative one to the end, and we can place the one, the two, the three, and the four as products here, uh, and then pay for it in the denominator. So we're going to basically multiply by four factorial and divide by four factorial. So I really think it's probably easier just to do this separately. I'll, I'll leave that up to you. So now we've got this four factorial here. I'll just write it out the same way. And so now all of this can just be replaced with n plus four factorial by definition. So the added complication of the binomial coefficients makes the binomial series necessarily more complicated, but it's certainly doable. And so now we see that we have negative one to the n power, and then we have n plus four factorial. And then downstairs, we have four factorial times n factorial. Now, one thing, one thing that we can notice here, and that's very uh, telling about uh, how we choose to index, and like I say, WebAssign will always help you out. Um, when we have n equals zero, uh, k choose zero by definition is one. And so if we look at that, can, can we kind of cheat here and, and get what we need? For instance, if we, if we think about what happens with n equal to zero here, if we just kind of check, I think we'll be, able, be okay. So let's check this. See if we need to be a little bit more careful here. If n is equal to zero, the very first uh, term is by definition one. That's gonna be, in this case, negative five choose zero. So do we get that with this basic formula here? So we'll have what negative one to the zero, which by definition is zero, and we'll have four factorial because the n is zero, then a four factorial. And then of course, by definition, zero factorial is one. So this will actually give us a one. So we can actually include the zero term uh, in the uh, indexing without having to separate it. So we often check that. WebAssign will always be very good to you. When it makes sense, they will hint you to that. They'll push you in that direction. But you wanna make sense that you take care of that first term, especially if we're kind of, we're thinking of this as starting with n greater than or equal to one, and then moving this along. So we can kind of fidget with this and see that it's actually gonna be okay to include this with this formulation here. So this implies with this check that one over one plus X to the fifth is this series. Now you're thinking, well, if you could just type in the binomial coefficient, but I think, I think WebAssign is gonna ask for more than that. Obviously, if that's all you had to do, that'd be fine. And if you, you know, you, you think about it, Basically, what we're doing is just interpreting the binomial coefficient when we use the binomial series. That's the difficulty. This makes this series real to us in the sense of utilization. So now we'll have the series n equals zero to infinity, and then we can fill in our general term, uh, the coefficient of x to the n. So we get negative one to the n, n plus four factorial, four factorial times n factorial, then x to the n. So like I said before, since the k is less than the negative one, we're kind of out with that. We don't, you know, not much fun here. 
So we only get X between negative one and one. We can include the endpoints as I gave you in that convergence uh, result that, that utilizes Rob's test. Again, they're, they're, as, you, as you study more mathematics, ladies and gentlemen, you learn more sensitive tests and, and you're still studying the same types of objects but what's so nice about the calculus sequence is that it opens the door to so many uh, different disciplines. Uh, calculus has become the bedrock of, of STEM and uh, mastery of it, uh, well, at least a good understanding of it is, is important. And um, we're, we're finding here that, that the key to staying abreast of things, that is when you, when you finally get your professional job uh, you'll always educate yourself. You'll always be rising to the next level uh, and rethinking what you know. Uh, so the education process will never stop. Formally, when you're out of school, you'll think it has stopped, but it, it will not have. And the challenges you, you have now will, will pale in comparison to the challenges that you have with your job. Uh, the, the good thing about a great job is that it's very rewarding but it will, it will tax you and, and keep, you, uh, keep you honest and all. So, so that's a good thing. That's why you're working in STEM uh, because you wanna make a difference. But note that anything you do will make a difference as long as you do it uh, as, as something uh, with integrity and, and, and with purpose. So, so when we see this, uh, we just, educate ourselves more and more on how our calculator works. Now, there was one other example that I want to do that, that goes actually back to the uh, Taylor polynomials that you did. And you had some really interesting examples. And I like, I like how uh, Dr. Larson makes all of this work. He, he combines the topics in a way that, that synthesizes them very well. So, so I had some questions about this in my office hours. And so I thought I would actually do this one before we hit the parametric. So here's what this example said. This is an excellent example of where we just have to do uh, the, the rote uh, algebra. So it says find the first four non-zero terms of the Maclaurin series. We spend a lot of time with Maclaurin because we, we like the, the center zero, very useful. The Maclaurin series uh, f of x equals, now you've had like x times sine x, now we're gonna say e to the x times sine x. So, Using the algebra of functions, you know, we can do compositions. I mean, if you're trying to find a power series uh, for a different uh, function, but you've got the uh, uh, basic power series in the list, then you can use functional algebra and analysis to, to generate a new series. You may have to check endpoints or whatever, but, but that, is, that is a remarkable tool. It's like having an integral table plus one. So what we want to do is just say, okay, we can use our list and know what these actual series are, at least for our first few terms, and then multiply them out uh, as we would with the distributed law. So first, let's just observe. And I wrote this out in a way so that we, we cover the bases. And, and then you start multiplying, and then you can kind of stop with the powers knowing that that you'll probably have more than enough to get four non-zero terms. So for instance, e to the x Maclaurin series, we know what it looks like. This is one plus x plus x squared. And I'll go ahead and factor, write out the uh, factorials. x squared over two plus x cubed over six plus x to the fourth over 24, just write out several here, plus x to the fifth over 120. So we know, we know what this looks like. And then of course the sine series for Maclaurin, 
this is a this is an odd function. So we have the odd powers. So we get x and it's also alternating. So we get x minus x cubed over six plus x to the fifth over 120. And I don't think we'll have to go, I write this down not like we're gonna need it. Uh, uh, seven factorial is 5,040. If we just multiply uh, 720 by, by uh, uh, seven. So unfortunate, but it is what it is. So what we can do is just use a distributive technique. So in this case, e to the x, and we'll just, we'll just map things out like we're in college algebra. Everything we learned, we really learned in the previous courses. So I'll write down several terms here. So we'll have one plus x plus x squared over two. So this is where we're multiplying series. Division's kind of a pain, but, but you can do it. So we'll just write out several terms and then we'll kind of stop the process when it looks like we have you know, more than enough. And then for the sign, just fill these in. So x to the fifth over 120. So what, and, and so this is our, this is our f of x, okay? So formally that's our f of x. Now what I did, and, and this is up to you, when you're trying to create polynomials in pre-cal and college algebra with certain characteristics, the problem sometimes requires you to write them in descending order. And so you do this type of, of computation. So what I want to do is just utilize the distributive law and just keep things tallied uh, uh, with powers and then try to add them uh, at the end in a column wise fashion. So notice what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start here with this term and multiply here and then tally things. And then when it feels like we've got enough terms, we'll just add them and look for four non-zero terms. So let's start with the one. So the one times the X and we'll keep everything in a or, nice order. Now notice we, we're gonna have a square and a cube and a fourth and all that. So we'll leave a little space if we don't have one here. So notice in this case, we have a negative X cubed over six. So leave a little space. So if we have a square in the next time we can put it here with, in its own column. So we'll have negative x cubed over six here. And then we have one here. So leave some space because we want to put a column here. x to the fifth over 120. So we think this is a little bit silly that we have to go out this far. And then one here will give us a negative x to the seventh. This is always a popular problem. And this is an excellent example. And so now I think that'll do it for us. Now we'll start with the X and do the same thing. So X times the X, that'll be X squared. And then we have X times the negative X to the third over six. So that'll be negative X to the fourth over six. And then we have X times X to the fifth over 120. So we have X to the sixth over 120. And then after that, I, I don't think, I'm not gonna go any farther. I think that's gonna be more than enough. But we'll keep our fingers crossed that this will be enough. And now uh, let's do the X squared over two and start here. So that's gonna give us an X cubed over two.
and then here the x squared, this will give us a negative x to the fifth over 12. If we multiply the two and the six, and then after that, uh, you're thinking, you know, at this point, do I need to do any more? Well, let's try one more. So we'll have x to the seventh and two times 120 will be 240. Again, probably more than we need. And now we're thinking, okay, well, let's just make sure we've covered all the bases. As we move here, we still can get a fourth power, so we don't need to ignore this. So we wanna generate as many of the lower powers without hopefully leaving out one. And that of course would, would change the answer. So we don't wanna leave out important lower powers. So here we're gonna have an X to the fourth over six. That's very important. And then we multiply here, we get an X to the six with the negative over 36. So that's important. So, so the idea here is that we're, we're generating enough lower powers and we certainly can't get any more fours out of this if we keep going. Now, when we do this, if we think about the uh, next, rung in the ladder, so to speak, we can get a fifth degree term here. So we don't want to ignore that. So we're going to have an X to the fifth over 24. And then the next one, when we multiply, that's going to be an X to the seventh. But again, I don't think we're going to need that. So, so if we, if it turns out that we need more terms, we're fine. But notice right now, if we look at all of this, we've got the, all of the six terms, powers, and when we multiply through here, we, we know that we've got all the sixes. And then we've got all the fours, that's gonna zero out. We've got all the five powers, and, and I don't think we're gonna need this. Then if we need more, we'll generate more. So, like we're in college algebra. There's nothing fancy about this except just making sure that we uh, cover all of our bases. So now we can bring the X down and then we can bring, and I've actually notated all of this, we can bring the X squared down. And now here are the X cubed. So at least we've got three terms that are non-zero. So I've, we've done more than enough. So here we have, if you like, negative one six plus one half X cubed. So that gives us three terms right there that, that pretty much put this problem to rest. But notice these terms absorb. So we did need to exhaust the X to the fifth, okay? So, so this absorbs, so we get plus zero times X to the fourth. Let me put that in the coefficient in the brackets. Let me just write that down so you see that. So this is negative one six plus one six. So this term is going to absorb. And then the X to the fifth, we have three terms. So we've got one over 120, negative one over 12, and then one over 24. And this multiplies X to the fifth. And this is not zero. So we don't need to move out for any more powers. So that's sufficient. So just make sure though, as you multiply that you get all the lower powers that you don't leave out, just keep checking. So this is just a very straightforward exercise, not very fancy, not very sophisticated, but certainly uh, better than trying to do Taylor coefficients for this function, uh, which would be like working with the tangent function. Not a lot of fun. So we use the power of the mathematics to move the problems forward. So now notice, all we need to do, this is zero. So these are checked off. Let's just say, what does this equal? So this is X plus X squared. And of course, now we can just get a common denominator here of, well, if you like, 
I'll do this this way. I was going to, I, I like to factor everything, but I'll resist. So we get plus a three. Now here, of course, this is zero. So we're done with that. And then here plus, notice there's a 12 in everything here. So that's going to be what a one tenth minus a one plus a one half, right? So this will give us x plus x squared plus uh, what, two over six x cubed. Now we have one twelfth, and so we can just use in this case a 10, right? Or you can add this up, it's okay. So we have one minus 10 plus what, a five? So this will give us x plus x squared. Of course, that'll be one third. And then here we have a one twelfth. And this will give us a, uh, a six minus a 10. So that's a negative four. So we're almost done. We get a couple more sheets of paper. So now we have x plus x squared plus one third x cubed. And then of course we get absorbing here. So this will be plus one twelfth, if you will. And, and let's do it, let's do it this way. Let's just absorb the four into the 12 with the negative outside. So that'll be a three and a one tenth. That's easier to see X to the fifth. So this gives us X plus X squared plus one third X cubed. And of course that'll give us a negative one over 30. So when you look at examples like this, <clears throat> this is where the power, and, and this, you know, when you're doing a physics problem or an engineering problem, this may give you more than enough error accuracy. The, the idea is that, again, the simplicity of the polynomials is what we like. You think about the binomial series. When we do this, we're making this more realizable. This you can work with. When you stare at this, you're like, okay, that's nice and it's a beautiful symbol. I know what it means, but it's not very practical. So when you're trying to do calculations, you need a form that's usable. So it may be more advantageous to you with your calculations in your classes, say in science and engineering, to utilize this as an approximation for this particular function. It really just depends on the problem you're doing. Uh, I see this when I teach pre-calc, the students don't always understand why, well, why do we have to do this problem? And I remind them, I said, you're gonna use this in calculus. You're gonna use this when you take partial differential equations. You're gonna use this when you take advanced calculus if you have to. The idea is that you set your students up for success by exposing them to the mathematics that they will have to use later. So just think about this as a means of utilizing the theory in a very efficient way. Even though I guess it kind of looks like we're back in college algebra, that's all we do anyway. All we do is arithmetic. That's, and and when, when your friends ask you, you know, what's calculus? You can just say it's sophisticated arithmetic. That you, you really start the process of learning mathematics with the goal, hopefully, most students that used to be where everybody would want to take calculus or at least take through uh, geometry and, and algebra too. But, but these days with our STEM society, calculus is almost a given. Even if, even if you are going in another path, I mean, the, the, if you get to a four-year institution, uh, you probably end up either in a business calculus class or a math major calculus. So the times are changing. 
So now when we look at the series, hopefully, hopefully as you work through your problems, you, you utilize everything you know. Don't worry about reinventing the uh, wheel, so to speak. What I want you to do is use the mathematics efficiently and make good decisions. I work hard to try to give you the ideas in a way that, that is uh, legitimate in terms of mathematics and keeping you grounded but you can always form your own signature with the problems. So, so do that as you work through, as, as many of you do. Now, the next uh, set of problems will deal with parametric. And I've got, <clears throat> got a lot of information here, more information than we can always digest. But I want to start with the concept of what we mean by parametric equation and, and why do we even care about it. Um, when, you, when you study curve theory, uh, at least the introduction, and it's a fairly rigorous introduction, in Calculus 3, you talk about vector functions. And vector functions are based upon a parameter. And the the components are just the coordinate functions. And so really that's uh, an essay on parametric equations. So let's, let's look at some simple examples. And the parametric part comes from the noun parameter. So for instance, let's start out with, I, I want to start out with some simple examples. I always do this backwards. I, I start out with really difficult examples and then, then everybody's like, can, can you give us a simpler problem? And I will. Let's see here, where's, where's that simple problem? I don't ever do simple problems. Okay, here we go. Yeah, here's one. So the idea is that if we think of a Cartesian setup, for instance, maybe we have, uh, let's just think Cartesian. I'll start with a simple example. Say we're, we're thinking about the uh, unit circle. We're, we're studying trigonometry. So we have x squared plus y squared equals one. That's a, that's a curve in the sense that when we look at this particular example, we think, okay, what if we were interested in working on this from the standpoint of a curve with one parameter? Well, then you think, well, that's not a problem because if we think about S1, what do we do? And let's just, use, we can use theta if you want. We define for S1, we define the X coordinate on the unit circle to be cosine theta or cosine T. And we define the Y coordinate to be sine theta, where, and we have two interpretations, it just depends where you start for the unit circle where theta corresponds to arc length measured from one zero to the terminal point x, y, or just the abstract angle or the angle theta that subtends the arc. And then you just learn that the uh, arc length is just r times theta when you move away from the unit circle. In the unit circle, the, r, the arc length and the uh, abstraction of the angle are, are synonymous. So, so you're thinking, we've already been doing this. So if we, if we want to think of an actual curve that's written as a vector function or parametrically, 
We just want one parameter. We want one input. So we can think of it this way. We can say, okay, well, we can define R of theta. This will be the notation you use in calculus. I, that's why I like the Dr. Larson's text. It's, it's the best. And um, I won't be teaching Cal 3 in the, in the spring, uh, uh, which is unfortunate. But, but it is, if you want to access the Larson text or buy an inexpensive copy online, that would be uh, good for your uh, education. We can say that this will now just be represented by cosine theta, sine theta. And so we can think of this as a parametric set of equations. Now we have the Cartesian curve and we have the parametrically defined curve. So Cartesian, and then we say parametric equations. So when we think about this, we're saying, okay, how is this an improvement? Well, you can differentiate vector functions that are Cn or C1 or C infinity. This is how you describe kinematics in physics using vector functions. It's, it's the, it basically, looking at vectors and vector functions describes curves. Then we have, we have vector valued functions to do the uh, vector calculus theorems. Newton had all of this in his brain. And so now you're thinking, okay, well, so, so we have this parameter and it can have certain values. And then you think, okay, well, the unit circle is basically two pi periodic. So we're thinking, for this parameter here, we should be able to cover this curve if theta lives between zero and two pi. So we're thinking, all right, that's easy enough. So, so now we're thinking with the parameter domain, and then you're thinking, well, if you replicate this two pi to four pi, and then four pi to six pi, you just keep wrapping around the circle. Okay, but that's useful because now you can think you're just a little bug walking around the circle and this is the path that you take. So now we can say, all right, well, what, what does this do for us? That's why I'm using this notation. It's just a little bit more convenient. We can say, what about a parameter value of zero? Let's just move around the uh, quadrantal, the axial uh, points of the uh, uh, S1 curve. So we'll say R of zero, that would be cosine of zero and sine of zero. And then of course you can think of these as vectors. Right now we'll just look at the, at the head of the vector and not really the application point. And then we can R of pi over two, just looking at the simple values. Of course, cosine of pi over two is zero and sine of pi over two is one and then r of pi, that'll give us, again, uh, a cosine of pi is negative one, and sine of pi is zero. r of three pi over two, that'll be a cosine of three pi over two, which is zero, a sine of three pi over two, negative one, and then, of course, we're back to two pi, so we we done one traversal, so we're back to one zero. So now you can see, if we go ahead and mark this off, we've got these points. We can just now write them as points if you want. We can think of one zero, or you can think of this as a vector with initial point here ending here. So you can think of it that way if you like as a vector. And then we have the point zero, one. This is going to be convenient when we do polar coordinates. We can think of this vector. And so now, and then of course here, negative one, zero. And then zero, negative one.
and then back to this point. So now, now you can say, okay, if we put in all these points, we can just connect all of these. This is the path that's parametrically represented. And this is all tied up with the Pythagorean theorem. I mean, the abstraction of trigonometry is, is a big deal. Trig is the hardest thing you do before you get to calculus. And in many ways, it's just as hard as the calculus. Ask my pre-cal students who are struggling right now, but they're working hard. So now you're thinking, all right, well, here's the curve, but now this parameterization has configured a traversal direction. So we start here and as we move through this, we actually move around the curve in the standard counterclockwise direction. So we say the orientation, orientation is counterclockwise. Or at least we have a, a path knowing how we traverse the curve. So, so the beauty of the parametric equation set up or the vector function is that it it more it's a more systematic a more efficient representation of a curve and so when you talk about curve theory this is where you start with the vector function with the parametric equation so to speak and then of course what's tied into this is the fact that we have the unit circle so we you you would say well how could we eliminate the parameter well you could say cosine x squared plus y squared cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is one. So that's why this parameterization works. It would have to satisfy this. So you've been doing this all along. You've already done parametric equations. You just didn't call them that. Okay. So we're going to do more with the so-called conic sections, but I wanted to use this as just a primer to let you know that this is something you have been doing, and it's really very simple. Now I had I had an interesting example. Maybe it was not very interesting and I just forgot about it. Oh, here we go. Let's just do some simple ones right now. So, for instance, you might be given, here we did this kind of reverse. We thought, well, let's just use what we know about trig and we'll start with the Cartesian and then we'll go backwards. Sometimes you'll have a curve and you really won't know what the curve is. You can get some idea about uh, some of the points and if it doesn't fit a particular pattern, you might do some calculus on it and figure out where it's smooth and things like that. Now, the idea here is this actually opens the door to smoothness, but we'll wait on that uh, definition. Let's do another example. Now, so, here we started with Cartesian. Say that you're actually given uh, a situation where you can actually determine the uh, Cartesian equation. That is, you could possibly, as we did before, eliminate the parameter. So say we have something like this, and this is as actually given in the parameter T. This is fun stuff. Well, the infinite series are more fun, but, but this is a nice uh, introduction. Cal 3 is fun. It's, it's a joy to teach uh, the, the very elegant theorems that use a lot of calculus one. And you don't have to do as many blasted integrals. So, so a lot of students are happy for that, but, but it's a very, very useful course. Now, say we had a parametric representation here. Now, for instance, when you're given parametric equations and there's no restriction on the variable, then you just assume it's as large as it can be where it will make sense. So here we're thinking, oh, t, t could be any, any real number. So there's no restriction on t. So now here we say t is the parameter. Parameter, parametric. And so, you're thinking, well, as a vector function, we can think of it like this, 2t minus five and 5t plus one. 
So you're thinking this would be a curve and we would follow along the curve. This would maybe we've got a boat in the lake and it follows this curve. Now, what WebAssign will ask you to do is say, okay, we'll eliminate the parameter and figure out the Cartesian equation. Now, in many cases, it's possible to do, but it, as you know, well know, solving polynomial equations can be uh, somewhat difficult and having an exact uh, formulation for the zeros uh, can be out of your reach, uh, at least from the standpoint of a closed form uh, uh, formula. So what we can do here is, that is determine determine the Cartesian equation by eliminating the parameter. So this is easy to do. In many cases, it's quite simple. So we'll say, well, x equals 2t minus 5 and y equals 5t plus 1. Well, this is just general math now. So let's just solve for t. So we have what? 2t equals x plus 5. So t is just x plus 5 divided by 2. This simple algebra. Do the same here. 5t equals y minus 1. So t equals y minus one times five. Now, of course, you could have done this in pre-cal. We just teach too much in pre-cal. We don't have time for it, but polar coordinates and this you can teach in pre-cal, but it's probably not the best time. And then the calculus part, obviously you can't teach. So this is why this is included in calculus because there's a calculus part to this. Now, when you look at this, you're thinking we've got two uh, uh, equations uh, for the variable t so we can equate them. So equivalently, x plus 5 over 2 equals y minus 1 over 5. So how, how could it be any easier? So let's just cross multiply. We get what? 5x plus 25 equals 2y minus 2. And so now you're thinking, well, uh, you know, we can keep it in like a standard form and do... Uh, do uh, y and x intercepts, or we could write it in the y equal mx plus b form. Your choice, it doesn't matter. So in this case, we could say 5x minus 2y equals what? Negative 27. That would be like the ax plus by equals c form. That would be one form. So that, that's a good form. Or WebAssign could say, uh, write it in the y equal mx plus b form, slope intercept. So we could have 2y equals a, uh, in this case, 5x. And here we'll add the 2, so that'll be plus a 27. So y is equal to 5 halves x plus 27 over 2. That would be another form. Again, it really doesn't matter, but of course, if WebAssign asks for one of these, that's what you have to give them. And they might say, well, write in this form, or they might say y equals, and you fill in the box. So it would have to be this form where you isolated the y. And so now we just see that t lives in the real numbers. And what we can see, at least by looking at this, as t gets larger, the values of x and y get larger. Okay, so it's a direct proportion of sorts. And so now we can think, well, we could, we could get a picture of this. This is now back to general math. Funny, you were actually doing calculus in general math because you were doing arithmetic, right? It's not maybe the kind of arithmetic that we do, but it's still the, the good planning for it. So now, for instance, if you, if you look at this, it's probably easier to, to set it up this way. If, if we look at this, um, and I'll, I'll get some points, and then I'll just kind of guesstimate with the, uh, the scaling. So here, if uh, y equals 0, then we get x is equal to uh, what? Negative 27 over 5. 
So that's just going to be a negative five and two fifths. And then, of course, if x is zero, y is just equal to uh, 27 over 2. And that's just going to be, well, what's that going to be? A 13 and 1 half. 13 and 1 half. So that gives us two points. So we'll do, uh, let's see, on the y axis, we'll just go in fives. So 5, 10, 15. So we have 0, 13 and a half, so about right here. And then we have uh, x axis, uh, y equals 0, negative 5 and two fifths, so we'll just do five, 10 like this, negative five, negative 10. And so about right here. And so we can connect. Again, our general math comes in handy. But now we can see, for instance, in, in this particular case, we, we can work backwards, but by the original analysis, as T increases, so do X and Y. So we have this traversal and this orientation. That's the direction we move this direction. So you're thinking you could use some calculus, you know, X prime is two and Y prime is five. Those are positive. So you think the values of, of, of X and Y are increasing. ST increases. So, so the, the idea here is when we, when we think about doing problems, you, you, another way you can do is just if you've got the parametric representation is just say, okay, well, what happens as we start with this value of T and we move to this value of T? It could happen that the parametric equation is doing all kinds of interesting things. That vector function is doing weird things. The coordinates don't really abide by uh, increasing or decreasing. Maybe they do some of both. <laughs> and so then you really get some interesting uh, orientations as far as the direction of tra traversal. So what you often have to do with parametric equations, ladies and gentlemen, is choose a path that will satisfy the type of problem you're working on. And this may be very useful. Say you're doing an engineering problem or physics problem or you're or you're doing a coding problem and you just want your particular object to move along a line, okay? And so of course, uh, we can already fidget this to start with the Cartesian and move to the vector function or parametric equation. That'll be something I want you to think about. You can actually devise that and go in the reverse process. So, so one technique would be to say, okay, if we start with parametric, what really is it? What is the curve? And we see it's actually a, a line uh, that we, we think of as in Algebra 1 in general now. So parametric equations. Now, let's look at this. I've got several examples here, and I want to use some of our conic sections too. So before we do that, let's look at a relatively straightforward example. Let's see, I've got it right here. I wanted to try to do these in orders that, that help you to understand this a little bit more easily since we haven't really been doing work like this. So in this example, uh, we have the following uh, parametric equations or parameterization. So we have x is equal to the square root of t. You can make up these problems and, 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 and now, you, now you have a source of creativity that you can tap into uh, and use your trig functions, you know. So when we look at this, again, there is no restriction on t except what is implied if we're thinking of these as real valued functions of a real variable. So here we would see that the, uh, the t would be restricted at least to non-negative values. So here, at least implicitly, we see that t or the parameter would have to abide by that restriction uh, uh, just based on the uh, equations. 
So now you might say, uh, determine, determine the Cartesian equation. And so when you look at this, you're thinking, well, this is just like the last one. We can eliminate T with no problem. And, and this is much easier. The last one just had a lot of arithmetic in it. So we, we see or we observe x squared equals t. If we just square the parametric equation for x. And so this would imply that y is just x squared minus one, which is a quadratic. How simple. So, so then you're thinking, well, can you just take any Cartesian equation and make it parametric by just replacing just by making x the parameter and the answer is yes for instance if we if we started with this we could just say r of x equals x x squared minus one right there and be done that's a parametric equation just using the graph so to speak and be like okay and this this is also good so any any curve you have where where y is expressed as an independent variable in the independent variable x you get a you get a, a natural parameterization and then of course you could replace x with t if you wanted but you get a natural parameterization just from the cartesian curve which is free and often very usable in a calculus setting so you don't even maybe have to get very creative you can say well i'll, I'll just use this so, so when you look at this, you see in this particular case that where do we begin? So we can say R, now let me, let me go back to this. We'll say R of T in the original is square root T. So this is just extra here, T minus one. So we see R of zero or T equals zero is really where everything begins. And so we get what? Uh, zero and negative one. And then of course, R of one would give us one comma zero. So basically again, as T increases, so do X and Y. So that makes our life really easy. So we're thinking this is, this is just as simple as the last one. They're not always simple, but we got to start somewhere. And so now you can see that we have uh, zero, negative one, and then one zero. And so we think about the standard Cartesian, uh, the parabola, the conic section, the quadratic function. You know, it's interesting, we don't start with parabolas, you just you're told that the graph of a quadratic is a parabola, but you really need to start with conic sections like the Greeks did because the algebra came after. So we don't always do things in the right order. So we're getting a traversal in this area, in this direction. And notice, just like in the calculus, you're seeing that we have what we call a, uh, a setup here with the, with the tangent, so to speak. Um, what, what, is it, what is it to be smooth for a curve? This is now a good time to talk about smooth. So for instance, here's a definition. We'll say, suppose R of T is represented uh, this way. We've got parametric, we've got a curve. Suppose R of T equals x of t, y of t is a parametric representation of a curve, is a parametric representation of a curve where, and we'll say that t lives in some parameter value set. And we'll say the curve, 
the curve, I'll just print that, the curve R of T is smooth if and only if. Number one, X of T and Y of T are C1. They have continuous derivatives. So remember their element of C1 on the interval I. I use that with Taylor's theorem. They're C1. That means continuous derivatives. We had Cn, right? Continuous through order n. And then we know that some functions are C infinity, that they have continuous derivatives of all orders, like e to the x or sine x. Some, some functions are really nice, others not so much, but that's okay. So continuous derivatives, continuous uh, first derivative. And then two, and this is, this has to do with describing things parametrically, ladies and gentlemen. It seems a little bit odd because we can actually compute, we'll talk about this in the next lecture, a Cartesian derivative that you did in Cal 1 and Cal 2, or in this class, via the parametric representation. And that's, that's interesting. So you're thinking we can recover well, maybe, maybe it's not too surprising either. We can recover the Cartesian derivative y prime or dy dx from the derivatives of the uh, parametric representations of x and y. So that's going to be a theorem that we talk about next class. But what's the other piece? x prime and y prime are not simultaneously zero. for t element of i. Now, of course, lots of times when we work with the calculus, we'll see that there's zero at the endpoints and we don't, we don't worry so much. But we want to avoid that because when we think of smooth, smooth, we think of the calculus sense. We think of the curve being continuous with no hiccups, so to speak, no corners, no cusps, no like, you know, you're, you're going in one direction and then you flip and go in the other direction. It's like, it's like you, you know, you don't hiccup when you're uh, traversing the curve. So smooth, smooth means what you think it means. And, and, and this part two here is a little bit odd right now, but it's gonna make sense later on. So first the C1 part, that we already know how to do. And then the second part basically just maintains the smoothness of the curve in the, in the intuitive uh, sense. So, so when we look, when we look here and we take derivatives, we, we see that we at least have smooth where it makes sense. Because if, if, again, these are nice and continuous and we can take derivatives, they're nice and continuous where they're defined. So if we have x prime, equals one over t or two root t. And then of course, y prime is just one. Okay, well, as long as we stay away from zero, then this is nice and smooth zero to infinity. So we say smooth, we say r of t smooth for t greater than zero. Because we have nice derivatives, c1, on that, and these are never simultaneously zero. Well, that can never be zero, so that's a freebie. So we get a nice smooth curve, and again, it looks smooth, but but we have to we have to uh, validate this. So smooth curves are things that you're going to talk about in calculus three, also. So we think of intuitively, and even in topology, smooth is characterized this way. And when you get to algebraic topology, which is even worse. You, you, you talk about these objects uh, as being smooth. Topology is a wonderful, wonderful subject, but, but it is probably one of the most difficult parts of uh, graduate level mathematics. It's abstract, abstract the abstract. So, so it's, it's nice stuff. And, we, and all of this, 
all this stuff we're doing now is generalized even more so in, in topology. So, so this can set you up for, for more math. Now, let's look at a couple more examples. And then we want to look at figuring out a parameterization for something that might be a little bit non-trivial. So here's an example. First, I, 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 I thought about this one and I said, well, they're, they're going to think I've lost my mind. This will have to do with the smooth part. And then we'll do a do a conic section and, and, and figure out a nice parameterization. Say say you've got an ellipse uh, in in physics and you want to parameterize it. You need you need to have that be your curve, and that's a nice closed curve. So here, let's hit the let's smooth it. Let's let's hit the smooth button right uh, with the focus smooth uh, whatever. Yeah, humor is not my strong point, but, but you already know that. So what I wanted to do was just do a little comparison. There's a nice web assigned problem, ladies and gentlemen, where they basically give you four curves. I'm not gonna look at all four of them, but the, the, the linchpin behind all of this is that they all represent the same Cartesian curve but the parameterization will introduce certain quirks that you may not be aware of. So for instance, I'm just gonna look at, I'm just gonna look at two of them. So here, here are two curves. So we're gonna look at R of T, uh, you, and when you do the problem, you'll do the other two, but that, that's the, it's kind of overkill, but it's a, it's a wonderful example. So we have E to the T, um, Ln, let's see, e to the t, and sorry, 9e to the t plus 8. So if you look at this curve, you're thinking, well, let's, let's smooth it again. There we go. If you look at this curve, you're thinking, okay, well, there's really no restriction on t. e to the t is a nice continuous function for all t. And so you, you think, okay, well, this is, this is a nice curve. It's a really nice curve. But but the outputs are all what non-negative. Okay, the range is non-negative. So 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 we're thinking, all right, whatever that is. So we we look at this and say, okay, so this is let's call this uh, well. Uh, I'll do more notation. Let's call this r sub one. Now r sub two. Now I'm using t's here, but. Uh, you can use uh, theta if you want. I'm going to call this t here also uh, uh, theta, just not mix them up, and say cosine t and 9 cosine t plus 8. And you start looking at that and say, well, that's odd. That looks very similar, except we've just replaced the e to the uh, t with cosine t, okay? And so now when you look at this, you're thinking, well, this works for T, real numbers, and then cosine is defined for all real. So, so in both of these cases, it would not be an issue, at least if we picked R's that way. But the smoothness may be an issue, and then also the, uh, the range may be an issue. So, so when you have a particular parameterization, as we saw with the quadratic, we only got one branch of the curve. The parameterization did not allow for the uh, opposite branch of the parabola. So, so again, the parameterization presents restrictions automatically. And so if you use one, you have to be aware of what it does and not be surprised that, that the output may be not what you think. So if you just assume and throw caution to the wind and, and you don't check your uh, parameterizations, then, then you may be uh, sorely disappointed. So now we're thinking, what's the Cartesian curve? So determine Cartesian curve. So in this case, we have, well, this is easy, but I mean, you know, it's, it's a nice problem. Uh, X equals E to the T, and we have Y equals 9 e to the t plus 8. 
Well, this is just like we had before. So equivalently, if x is e to the t, we can just replace e to the t with x. So we get y equals 9x plus 8. Well, that was easy. I mean, obviously, you see this, and it's not a barn burner. And so, and then, of course, we'll think about this. Let's do the same thing here. x equals cosine t. y is 9 cosine t plus 8. Of course, same analogy. x is cosine t, so we replace cosine t with x. So we get 9x plus 8 for y. So, so the Cartesian equation is defined at least in both cases to be the same. Now we, we look at this and say, okay, well, any t works in all of these. So t, t could live here. And then we think, okay, well, what, what about x prime? x prime is going to be what e to the t y prime is going to be 9 e to the t. That's, that's good. I mean, this C1, easy, nice and continuous, first derivative, continuous, no issues, never zero, so we can't get simultaneously zero, so we'll say this is a smooth, smooth curve. Smooth curve for T element of R. But the, the interesting thing about this is that the x has a lower bound of zero, it's never zero, and the y has a lower bound of what? Eight. I mean, it's, it's so, so notice here, we see x is greater than zero, and y, I mean, the, the, this has an asymptote is asymptotic to the uh, t-axis or the uh, t-axis in this case, which is zero. And so we get this. So when we look at things like this, we're restricting, we're restricting the actual output of the function, okay? So when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, so when we draw this, I thought this was an interesting example, you know, just, just even though it's very simple. So for instance, if we think about this, X is greater than zero. So, so again, if we put in zero, we get eight. So let's see, let's say five, 10. So we have zero here, this little circle. And then of course, if X is equal to one, Let's just spread this out a little bit. One, but we're going to get a 17. So we get a 15, a 20. So about 17, about right here. So we get this. And then, of course, this is increasing. So we get something like this. So, so we don't get the whole line, we just get a part of it. And it never equals, it never, we never hit that point because of these restrictions. So, so what we're seeing is that, that, that with a particular parameterization, it may not be very clear. I mean, what we see may not be what we think we're going to get, or for instance, or what we have may produce an output that is a little bit startling. And then we look at it and say, oh, okay, yeah, I see that. Now, let's look at this curve. Again, we get the same Cartesian curve, but, but what's going on? Now notice, x prime will just be negative sine t. And y prime, again, will be uh, what? Negative nine sine t plus zero. So when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, we, we can just restrict here, because I mean, we know this is a periodic function. This increases, decreases, incre I mean, it, it's nothing as simple as this. And so if we like consider, let's just consider this. 
consider something like this, negative pi over two to zero union uh, zero to pi over two. Now I could, I'm just kind of breaking this up into two pieces, but notice here, these are nice and continuous functions for all real numbers, but I, I chose this particular interval here because we, we know when this is gonna be zero, it'll just be what? Multiples of pi, namely, namely zero. So note, x prime of zero equals zero, y prime of zero equals zero. So we don't have the smooth, we don't have smooth at zero. So for instance, this would imply just for this small set, we'll say that R2 of T simultaneously zero is not smooth, is not smooth on this particular set. Because we have an issue at zero, not smooth. We don't have that here. So, so basically what this problem is, is illustrating, ladies and gentlemen, is that when you, when you look at functions like this, you, and, and this may be something you want, maybe you're doing a particular model where you want this to occur. So, so you have to analyze more closely. And so this is where the definition of smooth is very important. So now you're thinking, so what does that mean? Well, it's very, it's very easy. We can, we can analyze this. I'll do two separate graphs. So let's look, let's look at T here where we have negative pi over two to zero. And the reason I'm saying that is because I know on that particular set, the cosine function is increasing. But on this set, zero to pi over two, it starts to decrease. So this kind of gives you an idea what's going on at zero that may not be very intuitive. So here, let's just, let's just test this out. Um, R2 of negative pi over two, and then R2 of zero. We're gonna get the same things, but the, this is important. So when we put negative pi over two, again, the cosine there is zero, so we just get zero eight. And then at zero, at zero, of course, we get one, and here we get uh, nine plus eight, which is 17. Likewise here, R2 of zero, we already know what that is. That's 117, nice even function. R2 of pi over two is just R2 of negative pi over two, even function, we get zero eight. So now when we look at these, let's do the same kind of uh, deal here. Um, we'll do a one and then we'll do five, 10, 15, uh, 20, same over here. So 5, 10, 15, 20. And we'll just put the one here, spread it out. So now for this curve, we have at, uh, uh, so here, negative uh, pi over two. So we're gonna increase through, we get zero eight, all right here. And then as we increase T from negative pi over two to zero, we get 117, about right here. So we're doing this. We're traversing like that as we get to zero. And now of course over here, we start at zero and we're at what? 17, 117. And then as we progress to pi over two, we're back down to zero eight here. And so we got a hiccup. So in this interval, the traversal is this way. So it's like we're moving along and then boom, all of a sudden there's a hiccup and, and, and it changes and then there's another hiccup. So it's moving back and forth, kind of a crazy situation. 
maybe this is what you want. Maybe this kind of parameterization is what you want. You're working with something electrical and you need something to run back and forth. You see, the, the idea is that, that this is really odd compared to what's going on here. And the fact that this lack of smoothness here that we've noticed, we, we see that fact in the direction of traversal. So that's where the smoothness is violated. You can't just all just be running around a curve and then instantaneously you reverse your direction. Physicists love that. But that's where the mathematics says, whoa, wait a minute, you, you, you got an issue here, you got a hiccup, okay? So even though what we see here, and this is a fascinating problem, and when you do curve theory, you'll do more of this, and it's, it's a wonderful, for you physics people in engineering, this might be the part of math that you really like and can just go with it. I've had students go to A&M and be physics minors, they go into nuclear engineering and they love math, but they're more, they're more in love with the physics. So they get, they get the nuclear engineering degree and then have a minor in physics because you have to take so much physics, but they, they, they like it. They love the calculus, they love the calculus three. And so they, they find a new way to use math. So what I want to share with you here is something that, that when you just eliminate the parameters and you're like, well, I'm done with this problem, you have to look a little bit more closely. And so the parameterization or the vector function where you parameterize in terms of one variable presents, presents mathematics in a different way in a more sophisticated way uh, for particle kinematics, which you do in physics. So most physics students, they have to understand some differential geometry because you work on curves and surfaces in physics, especially as you elevate your, your study. Uh, so, so this may be something you end up doing more of. Now, so good example. Again, this, this will set you up for the web assignment, but I thought there's a whole lot of detail here that can get missed if you don't talk about it. Now, here's an example. I promised you the ellipse. So say you're working in a uh, physics situation or a uh, problem that you're doing in engineering. And you need to be able to parameterize an ellipse. So say we start with something like this. So we have, here's an example. So we have an ellipse. And uh, I'm teaching conic sections now in my pre-calculus class. So I thought this would be a nice way to, to involve you with that. Uh, e even though you learn your conic sections in pre-cal, we could also spend some time on conic sections, but I just kind of use them as examples because you've already studied them. Uh, if you want to look in the first section of chapter 10 to do a little bit more with conics, you can. Uh, basically what you learned in pre-cal. And if you had me for pre-cal, you probably learned that and, and then some. So you have X plus two. Well, none of you did because I, I don't know any of you. Uh, it's used to, all my students used to be students I've taught before, but now the, the tides are changing. Now, if we look at this and you remember what you did we thought about, you know, translation, uh, translating equations using functional transformations. And so we, we look at this particular setup here where we see that the foci are uh, centered on the horizontal axis because this is the larger denominator. And so what we have here, we have a center of the ellipse would just be at what, negative two, three. So you're thinking with an example like this, we've got a closed curve. So let's just, let's just, you know, let's just go ahead and do a little bit of pre-cal. This is easy. We're not gonna find the foci. I mean, we, you know, you know what uh, C squared equals A squared minus B squared, right? It's almost Pythagorean. So we have four and three, the major axis of length, uh, what, eight? So one, two, 
three, four. Oh, and I need to go ahead and move. Before I do this, let me just go ahead and move to the center. So we have a center of negative two, three. So let's say negative two, three, one, two, three. So of course my ellipse is gonna be up here in the writing. Sorry, I just should have moved it down a little bit, but we'll survive. So here we've got what four, so one, two, three, four. And then of course, one, two, three, four. And then uh, up three, one, two, three. Yeah, my scaling is a little, little pitiful, but we'll we'll survive. Oh, let me work on that. So when you look at this, you're thinking about the, again, the major axis through here and the minor axis through here. Both sides, of course, would be around here. So that's your ellipse. And so you're thinking, this is a nice closed curve. How could we actually work on this? And I'll go ahead and put the center here, negative two, three parametrically. Well, we can just use sines and cosines. And of course, you can use secants and tangents with hyperbolas, so you get the minus one. And that's something uh, you can figure out. It's very simple. So, so in this case, we can define, thinking we just want to be a little bug that marches along this ellipse, we can define x to be the center coordinate plus four times a cosine. You use a t or theta if you like. And we can define y to be the center plus b times the sine function. And then of course, t could be anything, but we can we know that these are two pi periodic, so we could cover the ellipse with that parametric interval for i, so to speak. That'd be our i for this case. And so now we have r of t equals negative two plus four cosine t. And of course you can think derivatives here. And so of course we'll have infinite infinite tangents here for the vertical tangents. And of course here it looked like we would have what horizontal tangents. So that'll be some calculus kind of just already opening the door to uh, what you're gonna have uh, in the next section. And then of course this will be three and uh, yeah, b is three. Uh, excuse me, B is three, so let me just write it in as three. How funny. Three, sorry. It, it is B and that's A, but it is three. So three sine T. So now we can do the same thing. We can do R of zero. So that's going to be what? A negative two, and then a zero here will give us a one plus four, and then a three plus a zero. So that gives us two, three, and then r of pi over two. So that'll give us a negative two plus a zero, and then a three plus a three, which is negative two, six, r of pi, just moving around. Hopefully this is gonna give us what we want, uh, pi, of course, this will be negative two minus a four because we've got the cosine of pi. And then of course we have a three plus a zero. So this gives us a uh, negative six, three. And then R of three pi over two. So again, this will be zero. So we get negative two plus zero. And then of course the negative three pi over two, that gives us a negative three. So this is three minus three, which is negative two, zero. And then of course we're back two pi, we're back up to here to two, three. We don't have to do that again. So now what we can see is two, three 
I'll do this in blue. So the point two, three is right here. Uh, the point negative two, six right here. And then the point uh, negative six, three right here. And then of course the point negative two, zero right here. So what we're seeing is that we're getting a traversal again, that's counterclockwise. So you build a traversal path just using some basic trig functions. So this you can generalize just like we generalize for a circle. You can generalize this with an H and a K and an A and a B and have, have an automatic parameterization of any ellipse. So this is really, really very straightforward because it just utilizes what you already know. And the main thing, again, um, if, you, if you add the two and square it out and all this, you get exactly and divide, you get exactly the one because cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. So, so this is basically just looking at the equation that you need to satisfy uh, in terms of the Cartesian and then rigging it with the sine and cosine. Like I say, with the hyperbola, you can use the secant and the tangent to get uh, the minus sign. So, so again, what you can see here is that now later on, we can still, we can think about the smoothness and analyze that and see that we would expect at least intuitively to have horizontal tangents here and we would expect to have vertical tangents here. That is if our drawing is good. So horizontal here and vertical here, and we would expect the calculus of the uh, um, particular uh, functions uh, to, to bear that out, so to speak. So, so we're thinking in this case, we're not like moving along and then we have a hiccup in reverse direction so much we're moving along and, and we have what we call a vertical tangent. So it's not gonna interrupt the direction of traversal like we had with the uh, linear function with the cosine. That was kind of crazy. So, so we, we, we have to look at this from a standpoint of calculus and hope that, that it's consistent with what we already know about uh, the trig functions. So this is, a, this is kind of fun. Now, what I say for last is the most difficult. And I did my best to blow up the figure and do this. So this is something, uh, this is in your notes on, on, on Blackboard, but this is a complicated example. So I wanted to set you up for it before I talk about it. Now, when it comes to other kinds of curves, I wanted to give you, in this case, a nice, this is a web assign problem. And of course they, they just push you off the deep end. <laughs> and so it's called the epicycloid. And this is, this, is, this is difficult even on an easy day, but it's doable. And I blew all of this up and I need to, and, I, and like I say, uh, this will be on the, uh, um, lecture so i want to i want to discuss this and i and i practiced drawing this and blowing it up and then i thought this drawing has to be good this is a case ladies and gentlemen without without some kind of picture of what's going on uh it would really be hard to to figure out uh what a good parameterization would be you could guess and then do the guess and check like we've been doing by checking points but this is a complicated deal. So I wanted to set this up to give you, and when we finish, we get what we call Professor Ron's user-friendly formulas. <laughs> so this, this th let me explain what I have here. And this is very important. I want you to understand this. This is a nice physics problem. So what I have here is I've got a fixed radius. So a fixed circle of radius T and then I've got S as the moving radius. So here, basically what we want to do is derivation of epicycloid equations. What's an epicycloid? Well, you have a fixed circle and you take a smaller circle or circle of whatever uh, dimension, usually it's a smaller, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, and you basically, 
situate them tangentially, like I have here. And this circle starts to roll and it rolls along the circumference here without slipping. And what I've done in the red is that you start to generate what is called the epicycloid. That is, you get this curve that will wrap around the fixed circle, but then of course you're going to have these cusps here. It's like it <coughs> hiccups, you know, it's like if you were rolling a circle down the, down uh, uh, the sidewall, and, and fixing a point, you would get these cycloids and pick up and then you'd have another cycloid and a hiccup. So the hiccups here are going to be where you basically have generated a cusp. So these types of, of, of curves are just ubiquitous in physics, but, but Talk about a derivation that's doable. So here's what I've tried to do here to make this doable. Now, what you do and, and what Dr. Larson does in the text, if you look in the ebook, he gives you some hints to be able to write this up. So what I've done here <clears throat> is I've moved the circle basically up an angle theta. So the problem says, figure out what this red curve is going to be in terms of theta, like easy, right? So, so the first thing that we have to notice as we roll along here, and my scale is not the best, but I, I drew this like three or four times before I got something that was decent. The one in your notes uh, on Blackboard is smaller. It was too small. And so as this curve wraps around here, this curve touching this, what is generated here that is, as you this curve moves, this arc here, even though I should have put this curve a little bit over here more, be more convincing visually, this arc here that's mapped out from this is equivalent or congruent to this arc because they're touching. And, and as this rolls around to generate the arc, you just basically generate this circle here with another arc that's congruent to this arc because they've been touching the whole time. And so that's the key to the argument. That is the linchpin of this argument. And if you don't draw this out, you don't see it, which is kind of amazing to me. So now <clears throat> that's what gets the ball rolling. And I've labeled all of this. So pay attention. This is important. I will test you on this. The, <clears throat> and then you say, well, no, you won't. You always say you will. Well, if I say it, you need to prepare for it. So notice in this particular case that this arc, I've labeled it AB is equal in terms of length to AP. So notice P is just the general point on the epicycloid. And then all this other stuff, I've just extended, again, the radius T through the radius S to the center of the smaller circle. I call that C. I call the tangential point right here between the circles A. And then of course the point here at the edge of the circle B I drop the perpendicular, that becomes point E. And then of course, the X here, boom, da, 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 is right there. The X coordinate and the Y coordinate da, 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 is right there, Y. So we really need to find X and Y. But before we do that, notice, if these two are congruent, then we just use R theta. That is radius times the subtended arc to get the length of the arc length from pre-cal. Easy, right? So here, this arc is what? T theta, R theta. This arc here is, and I'll call this uh, angle here, alpha, alpha, alpha S, or S alpha. Now we want to write, this is, this is the key, because y'all see here, I've got key step here. Without this, the problem doesn't go through. So if we want to write everything in, terms of theta, we have to write alpha in terms of theta. So now we can solve for theta just by dividing by S. So alpha is T divided by S, that is the radius T divided by the radius S times theta, just using pre-cal arc length. Now, here's one way to do this. This X coordinate can be derived fairly easily if we look at this, if we look at the distance from O to E 
And of course, we've got this big triangle here, right triangle to do the sines and cosines for that. And then if we use this smaller right triangle here, D to P. So I've labeled all these intersection points. So X will just be OE plus DP right here. So we need to figure out these two segment lengths using trigonometry and the co-function. Now Y, again, a little bit more complicated, but doable. Y is this distance here. So we have to, we have to use two distances that are simple, simpler, excuse me. So what we're going to do is we're gonna find the distance C to E using the big triangle, and then the distance C to D using the smaller triangle with the sines and cosines. And then the difference is just this length right here, which is Y, the Y coordinate. So that's the kind of the recipe there, all right? Now, so when we do this, we're thinking, okay, theta is theta, theta is theta, but we need this angle right here because we need an acute angle for this smaller right triangle. And I could have called it phi, but I use the letters since I've got these letters here for the segments to just do that. Sorry about the three letters, but I did it anyway. So we have angle DCP. Now angle DCP, notice this is theta. This acute angle is just pi over two minus theta using the complementary status. And so we subtract that from alpha. So DCP is alpha minus this smaller angle, which is pi over two minus theta using the big triangle. And then of course, that's great. That's simple Euclidean geometry. Distribute the negative. So we get alpha plus theta minus pi over two. Okay, now we figured out alpha up here. I want you to learn this, so pay attention. Alpha we learned up here. So we replace alpha with T over S times theta. And so now we have two thetas here. So get a common denominator of S. So we have T plus S over S times theta minus pi over two. And you're thinking, oh, co-function, co-function. So, so the, but it's kind of flipped around. So now when we look at this, I've written key step here. This smaller, this acute angle right here in this right triangle, DCP is this right here. The ratio here of T plus S, the sum of the radii divided by the radius S times theta minus pi over two. This, this you would not see without this picture. So I'm not really sure how Dr. Larson expected you to do this unless you look at it this way. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's not possible. So now what I've done here, I put this in a red box as the key step to solving this problem. Now we just want to kind of go through all of these and, and figure out what they are. Some are real, real simple. Now notice here, CE is one of them. So we're just going to check them off. Let's find where CE is. CE, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> excuse me, is this opposite side of alpha, excuse me, of theta in the big triangle. So we'll do sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. The hypotenuse here is T plus S. So we have CE divided by T plus S. So CE cross multiply is just T plus S times sine theta. That was easy. That was the easy one. So check, check, okay? <clears throat> now, now I'm looking for CD. Now we're thinking CD. CD's right there. That's relative to this angle here, this, <clears throat> excuse me, DCP, it's the adjacent side. Look, adjacent, adjacent, okay? So we're gonna say cosine of angle DCP equals adjacent over hypotenuse. What's the hypotenuse? It's S, right? So we have <clears throat> cosine of angle DCP is CD over S, okay? CD cross multiply is just S times the cosine of angle DCP. What's DCP, everybody? It's right there. Key step. Now it's simple. We're just using right triangle ratios. And that you did that in general math. Now, here's where we use some pre-cal. Notice this angle, we take the cosine of this, but I'm going to factor it. 
<clears throat> to make it into the co-function. So the co-function, I have to have the pi over two first. So I'm gonna factor this, factor the negative out of this and write it as pi over two minus t plus s divided by s times theta. Now, help me out, true or false, cosine is an even function. Professor Ron, I know, yes, sir. What is it? It is even. So the negative absorbs. So now what we see is in this particular case, we have cosine of the pi over two minus the angle. That's the cofunction identity. So that's equal to sine. Remember, sine, cosine of pi over two minus a is sine of a, their cofunction. So now we've got the cofunction. So now look, CD right here is just sine, excuse me, S times sine of, <clears throat> excuse me, T plus S divided by S times theta. Well, looks like we have Y, don't we? Now, again, this is simple, simple use of identities here, but, but again, it requires that we have this step. Without this step, we are sunk. Now, let's go up here to X. So we'll put all this together on the next page. So we figured out in this case, we figured out CD and we figured out CE. So we got Y and we'll, we'll put it all together. Now we need OE. Now let's look, OE right there. This is a big triangle. So notice OE is the cosine of theta. Cosine of theta will involve the cosine. So cosine of theta will be what? In this case, opposite over hypotenuse. Now, let me just see where I've done this. So like right here, uh, let's see here, theta, OE, we've got this here, and then we've got sine, we've got that. Oh, right here. Oh, oh, look what I did. This was interesting. I actually changed this up a little bit, ladies and gentlemen. I actually used this angle here. Now look, OCE. OCE, if this is theta, OCE is what? Pi over two minus theta. Oh, oh, okay. So I guess I needed to do that so I could use this. So notice, notice, OE relative to this angle is the opposite. So OCE, OCE, sine of OCE is opposite over hypotenuse. OE over T plus S, cross multiply. OE will be T plus S times sine of pi over two minus theta. Well, that's what we used over here. That's the co-function. So sine of pi over two minus theta is just cosine theta, just like what we used here. Same thing, just split. So now, now OE, the distance from here to here is this, check. Now DP, DP right here, this one, DP, that is opposite of angle DCP, opposite. So now we'll use sine of angle DCP opposite over hypotenuse. So we have opposite, which is DP. So we're gonna get that divided by S, which is the hypotenuse. Now cross multiply, so DP equals sine, excuse me, S, times the sine of angle DCP. Well, same old, same old song and dance again. Notice here, when we do this, we do the same factorization. We do the same factorization. We flip it around, so the pi over two is first. But notice kids, or ladies and gentlemen, the sine function is odd. So the negative factors, and then this becomes the cosine using the co-function. So again, this factors, factors because sine is odd. Now you see why I saved this for last. This is, this is complicated, but now you're ready for it because we've been talking about parametric, but this is pre-cal, this is trigonometry, but, but very focused. Now, now what you see is that DP, which we have here is the negative of S times the cosine of this guy flipped around, that is T plus S over S times theta. So that's DP. So now on the next page, we figure out all of these. So now that we figured out all of these, this is your, this is your parameterization forever. 
You don't have to redo this again. I want you to learn what I've done here and practice this because this is extremely non-trivial. And I tried to set this up in a way that was so simple that, that you could follow it. It is complicated, but it's simple right triangle trigonometry utilizing this key step here and the co-function identities. Now, we figured out OE and DP. Remember, OE plus DP. So OE is T plus S times cosine theta minus S times cosine of T plus S divided by S times theta. So we fill that in. So DP, remember, DP right here. DP right there. And then Y is CE minus CD. <clears throat> Notice we have CE here. That was the first one we did. That was really easy. And then CD is right here. So we just filled them in. Now notice why I've written my derivation this way. So now if you do a web assigned problem with an epicycloid, the T is the fixed radius and the S corresponds to the rolling circle radius. And so now you have, you have parametric equations and I'll just say non-trivial. This is not like doing the ellipse or a circle or anything like that where we could base, basically piggyback on what we learned in pre-cal in a very straightforward manner. But at least you can see that the pursuit of the parametric equation is doable. So now, if you have a problem where the T and the S are given, like you have in this web assigned problem, oh, how, I thought this was weird. They said, okay, figure out the parametric equations for the epicycloid if the fixed radius is four and the moving radius is two. Oh, simple, simple question, right? Well, yeah, as long as you do this and come up with this. So again, the analysis here has to do with drawing a figure and, and preserving the fact that these two arcs are congruent and writing the alpha here in terms of theta. This is completely non-trivial. So this is why this is important that you study this. This is not something you're just gonna figure out on a test. Uh, it's not gonna happen. You have to study this. And so now, now if we have this particular problem here in WebAssign, which you do, then you can fill in Professor Ron's formula. So if we want the X coordinate, so now you're thinking if, if we wanted to do, let's just go ahead and write this and we'll fill it in. If we want to do a nice vector representation, we'll just say T plus S cosine theta minus S cosine T plus S over S theta, then comma T plus S sine theta. So the Y's have all the signs in them. So that makes it easy to remember. Sine T plus S over S times theta, close. So you can think of it this way, ladies and gentlemen. These all look the same, except you got the T plus S with the cosine, T plus S with the sine. And here you have the S and the T plus S over S times theta, but here's, here we have the cosine and here we have the sine. So that would be easy to commit to memory. So now if S is two and, and uh, T is four, we get six. And then of course here S, we get the negative two and then six divided by two is three. Likewise, six, we get the negative two and six divided by three is this and there you're, parametric equations for these values of S and T. Now this is truly an elegant, elegant derivation. But it, like I said before, I'm not really sure uh, what Dr. Larson is. I did look in your ebook and there were some hints actually working with this. I've done this problem many times, but it's always been where I've come up with something. And I finally looked in the book and saw that he does try to set this up in a way 
uh, that you can understand it. But but I want you to work with this, and then I want you to look in your ebook and look at the cycloid. <laughs> it's like a fourth as difficult as this. It uses the same concept. But I wanted to go ahead and throw this one out here because I included it in the web assign to show you that sometimes you just have to work basic trigonometry. No calculus here. No calculus. I mean, you're thinking we've got all these circles that are tangent. That's calculus. But there's no calculus here. It's all basic trigonometry. But, but again, think of this like doing an optimization problem in Cal 1 where you really do have to have a picture of what's going on. Again, very neat problem. So today, we did a little bit of review with the power series. And so now we're looking at geometry. We're looking at taking equations that we've used often and then reworking them parametrically. And we've already started to introduce calculus into the parametric representation uh, with smoothness definition. So, so what I want you to do once you finish your test is now go through this and just kind of wash yourself in stuff you've already done. And note that this is actually quite doable and very applicable to what you're gonna be doing in physics and calculus three. So, so there is a beauty to calculus two. It pulls all the calculus one together and then it kind of pushes you into calculus three, which again is a very, very beautiful course. Um, more like Cal 1. Cal 2, like I say, is a topics course, and we do keep ourselves busy. So uh, again, I'll post an uh, announcement, ladies and gentlemen, about the next assessment, test number four. Um, I hope you're enjoying the series, and I hope you've enjoyed the introduction to the parametric. Uh, I, I say I like everything I teach, but I think this is really kind of fun, and I hope you enjoy it too. Remember, math is, is the key to STEM, and math is so rewarding, and I want you to feel that way when you study math. Be, be honest and, and forthright in your mathematics. Work your mathematics as I have taught you and rise to the next level. We had a student who I taught in 2012. Uh, my uh, colleague, Nate Wiggins, uh, formed, informed me of this. He, he took uh, Cal 3 with Professor Ryan. He took Cal 2 with me in the summer of 2012. And I think he took maybe DE or some other course with Nate. And now he's a, a, an engineer and, and he attributes his success in engineering to the rigorous uh, mathematics department at the North Campus. And I remember the student. Uh, and now he is uh, contributing to the foundation and to our mathematics department very handsomely. Uh, so, so remember, kids, that, that, that the key to success is the work and the effort and, and appreciating the mathematics and the detail that it requires. And so uh, Nate said, well, if, if our students complain about us and say we're too tough, it's because we want you to achieve greatness. We know what it takes and we know you can do it. So please continue to work hard, keep the steam moving, and then once it's all over, you can take a nice break. So I appreciate your attendance today. And if I don't see you at office hours, uh, uh, good luck with your studying uh, and take care. Enjoy the cold weather. Bye.